Welcome everyone. I'm Rachel Green, Digital Communications Specialist here at McNaught McKay Electric Company. And I want to welcome you to our latest Mac Live series, the Industry Expert Exchange. For those of you who have joined us before for our virtual Lunch and Learn series, this is a bit of a change of pace. We'll be hosting these live streams once a month on Thursdays at noon Eastern. So you can still join us on your lunch break. Um, each month we're going to cover a new topic exploring the latest and greatest technology developments and challenges in that focus area for that month. And as you can see, we're going to be doing a panel format with specialists from all five of our regions. And this means that you don't have to wait until the Q&A portion at the end to ask a question. You can ask us those questions throughout the session as we go along, and we will answer them in real time. So if you're just joining us, say hello to us in the comments section. Let us know where you're tuning in from today. I'll be monitoring that section as we go along. If you have any questions, I'll pass them along to our panelists. Um, I want to mention quickly that if you have a question that we can't get to today, or if you're watching this as recording and you have further questions for us, you can always reach out to us at the Mac Live at mc-mc.com email address. That email address is in the description of this video below, and I'll repeat it again at the end of the session. So this month's topic is safety, which is a really broad topic, and we're going to dive right into that topic. Um, but before we do, let's meet our panelists here today with us. Um, I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourselves. We'll go around the screen. If you can just give us your name, the area of expertise that you work in, and where you're joining us from today. Um, and let's start out with Chris. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris Haichu, uh, engineering supervisor for the sensor safety and industrial controls team out of Southeast Michigan. Great. Thanks for joining us. Gerald, do you want to go next? Yes, I'm Gerald Clark from the uh, Toledo, Ohio office, and I, too, am sensor and safety specialist. Wonderful. Um, Paul? Hi, I'm Paul Pluto, industrial controls, sensors, and safety specialist, and I'm out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Great. Travis? Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Coastal, we don't McKay. I'm a smart components specialist, Travis Dixon. Wonderful. And last but not least, Austin. Hey folks, Austin Davidson. I am the industrial controls sensor and safety product manager uh, for the Atlanta, Georgia region. And you have come prepared for this discussion. I can tell. <laughs> awesome. Um, so today we're going to start out talking about the safety life cycle, and I'm actually going to share my screen just to have a visual of that safety life cycle to reference. Um, we're not going to keep this up the whole time. Um, as I'm sharing it, though, I'm going to go ahead and direct our first question to Gerald. So, Gerald, can you kind of walk us through the safety life cycle and what it means um, for our plant managers? Well, first, I want to explain that the machine functional safety life cycle, as you notice, it is a cycle and we often start with one hazard or risk assessment. And as from a machine builder's perspective, hazard or risk assessment would be absolutely be the start where, and then you would go into functional requirements and then ultimately design and build and verification, installation and validation. But from a perspective of an end user, maintain and improve is typically where they are. And the, what I wanted to point out is that inside of this cycle, you can have iterations of cycles. So, I have a couple things that I want as, to be, as an end user. I not only want functional safety, but I want reliability. So there's opportunities in, in step five to maintain um, periodic testing, preventative maintenance actions, and, these, and changes to the um, machine for uh, performance or cycle time may put me right back into one for a hazard or risk assessment with the machine change, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, for our next question, I'll, I'll direct this one to Austin. Um, can you talk to us about the value of getting a risk assessment done? Yeah, of course. So, like Gerald said, it's, it's kind of a never-ending cycle if it's done correctly, but if you're if you're beginning from the ground up, you do have to start somewhere. It wouldn't really make sense starting it, uh, maintain and improve if you haven't even assessed your risk. So, uh, from the distributor side, I feel like a lot of the time we get questions on you know what what do I need to install to make this safe or you know what product do you have to do this or that, and 
that's great. We have a lot of a lot of great products uh, that are intended to be used in those situations. But if you do not perform a risk assessment prior to these installations, you're not really doing your due diligence. So a lot of the time we we kind of considered the risk assessment as a, a CYA, which if you know what that acronym is, you do. But basically, it's there to cover you from a liability standpoint. Um, so that if something does happen, you can demonstrate that we have done our due diligence and not just gone and thrown a bunch of uh, safety devices wherever it makes sense. So really, if we were, I know we're not going to break down the whole thing, but essentially what a risk assessment looks like is you would take a machine or an area that uh, you're assessing and you would assess each risk or each hazard basically on how severe uh, the, the hazard is if it were to occur. So that's, you know, life or limb uh, type of assessment. And then we would look at how often somebody might encounter this. So that's kind of the basic version of it, but we assess how frequent, how severe, and that'll give us an idea of, of how deadly or how hazardous uh, this area is. So you really need that as your first step so that you can properly mitigate whatever whatever hazard is there because otherwise you're kind of just shooting in the dark absolutely um does anyone else have anything to add to that and the, the value of risk assessment or areas where it would help with machine safety as well yeah so i i'd like to add um the the output of the risk assessment gives you the opportunity to address all the gaps discovered within the assessment so your functional requirements are are created from those from those risks that you've identified. So it's difficult to get to step two without step one. Mm. Yeah, kind of starting from behind if you don't know what you're working with. Awesome. Um, and I think something of note. Um, so of course, McNaught and McKay, we. We are a service solution and product supplier kind of all built in one. Um, when it comes to these risk assessments, typically we will partner with uh, systems integrators that are we have good relationships with uh, and that are trained to do these risk assessments. Um, and they typically will help say if you're an end user, they'll help you walk through this and make sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of uh, liability mitigation. Uh, an actual deployment of the um, the devices that you'll ultimately use to to mitigate these risks. And that is something we offer across all of our regions, correct, guys? Yes, yep. absolutely. Wonderful. Um, kind of getting into the the nitty gritty of this, then um, our next question would be for Travis. Um, when do you know it's time to migrate obsolete safety relay specifically? So, in speaking, speaking on the safety life cycle, that would be technically number five because it's already an existing system, and uh, you're looking to migrate an obsolete product. And if you if you got a decent relationship with your local Mac and Mac IC guy, he's going to let you know up front that hey, you got some product in the field that's that's going obsolete, and um, if it's a light for light change, great, no issue there. But if it's not, and you're looking to uh, migrate to something maybe you're going from a standard safety relay maybe looking at guard link um that's something that you know mac and mac solutions group would definitely like to take a look at helping you with you know walking through the with, with an integrator walking through a risk assessment identifying the functional requirements helping with the design and if, and if need be helping with the installation and validation um and if it's something that the end user might want to do on their own Rockwell offers several great uh, tools to assist with that, um, like Safety Automation Builder, Safety Functions. They got uh, an overview of what uh, what safety system you might be trying to, to lay out and, um, and a hardware list and wiring diagrams and even validation portion of it. Um, some other tools like Systema. Uh, safety integrity software tool for evaluation of machine applications. That's another great software. Um, so. And these softwares are help with the monitoring. Correct. Yes, it, it will help with the design of the safety system. Yeah. 
Yeah, these, a lot of these softwares that he's talking about, what you can do is you can take uh, essentially the risk assessment, we'll say that you had on paper, um, or your analysis of, of these risks, and you can actually put that information into the software, and it'll it'll do the math, if you will, in the background, and then spit out um, essentially suggested ways to to mitigate the risk or what that risk number is, and um, if it's too high for. And again, that that is the one thing about safety you have to understand is um, there is no right answer most of the time. A lot of it is, um, I, I'm not sure if preference would be the right word, but a lot of it is kind of up to the person who is, is doing the installation um, and is really taking on the liability. Because um, at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, I, I've been told this a million times, the only safe, completely safe machine is a machine that doesn't exist at all. Pretty much every machine inherently has some sort of risk and for them to actually do what they're intended to and for the operators to to manufacture whatever they're trying to manufacture usually they have to interact with that that machine so um i i know i'm kind of taking this to a, a side a little bit but even like the hard hat i had on there are other portions of safety that's not just equipment there's um standards and uh, rules and regulations we can put into place that are also intended to help protect personnel. So um, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to protect a, a person from a machine. Um, but at the same time, and maybe that's something we can speak to, functional safety has been a big push, uh, at least from the, the Rockwell side for some years now, because if you make a machine, we'll say too safe or it's too difficult uh, for the operator to actually get done what they need to get done, they will they will end up putting themselves in harm way just just to get that done. Um, and then we've kind of defeated the whole purpose of of all this work that we've done in the first place. So I think that is something kind of baked in um, probably to all portions of the safety life cycle, but I'd say um, definitely within functional requirements and design and verification, we we have to keep the person in mind as well. Yeah, that's a great point, Austin. Uh, one thing I think of during the design and verification phase is uh, the hierarchy of measures. <clears throat> you know, step one is, it, it, can you design it out, right? Mm -hmm. If you can design the hazard out, obviously that's the best best method to do. From there, you know, do I can I use a fixed or a removable guarding? Does that does that fit into the process? Um, after that, it tends to be where we come in. You know. Can I use an interlocked guard or a safety device like a light curtain, a safety mat, gate switch, those types of things. Um, after that, you know, there's awareness means like lights and horns, and then there's training and supervision. And finally, you know, PPE, sometimes, you know, that's the last, the last ditch effort, right? That hard hat you were wearing uh, can, can be pretty crucial. And that, that hierarchy is so important uh, to Chris's point, because when you think about adding complexity or electronic solutions to to mitigate risk versus a, a hard guard or or some redesign that can eliminate a pinch point you're so much better off if you can just eliminate the hazard um, automation engineers are often you know given a machine to mitigate a hazard that wouldn't necessarily have happened if this process in in the life cycle one and two were played out uh, more cooperatively between engineering groups. Yeah, definitely agree, Gerald. Wow, that's really interesting. So kind of just to go further down this path a little bit with the functional requirements and functional safety that you guys are talking about, is this something that you're all really seeing um, a big focus on in your regions? Um, can you give us some examples of maybe some solutions that customers have found that really helps maintain the functionality of the machine without, um, you know, bringing further risk to the operator. I think so. And again, every application is a little bit different. Um, so I'm not sure that I have one example of, of this, but I, I think typically it's, it's more of a, a holistic discussion or a holistic approach to to safety is um, like like we were just talking, or I guess uh, Gerald was just mentioning. Usually, a gate 
is you're going to keep people out with a gate. You put a gate there, you lock it. Physically, it's it's really tough to get in. Um, a light curtain, I can walk past a light curtain. Uh, but it's one of those things where if we if we have a good understanding of um, what the operators are required to do, and so again, that comes back to some of the functional requirements, some of the the risk assessment. If we kind of look at all these together, we can understand. Okay, well, we can't design that out, and um, hopefully, we can reduce the amount of times that the operator has to come in here. Uh, but maybe we can use this product over that product. Maybe we can. Um, th there are situations where if you're trying to make an area more functional, um, you can set different degrees of uh, safety barriers, if you will. So you could set an area where if somebody comes into that area, the machine maybe slows down uh, or it acts in some other way that uh, if they were to get any closer, we can trip another barrier and then the machine will shut down. So it's not nothing's really cut and dry, but there are ways that we can try and take into account what that person is going to be doing and not make their life any more difficult. A little deeper dig into the hazard or risk assessment. It's so critical that every stakeholder in that machine has a voice in that in that risk assessment. So mm -hmm. you want to know how the maintenance uh, interacts with that machine. You want to know how uh, the operator interacts with that machine. Anyone else that could potentially be uh, interacting with the machine. That way, all those things can be addressed to Austin's point. Do, do you need to go to a safe state? Can you go to a safe speed? Can you go to a safe position? Do you, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily want to e-stop a machine. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about, you know, we mentioned light curtains versus hard guarding. Um, this question would be for Paul, actually, which applications can be protected with a light curtain versus hard guarding? Well, going back to what everyone said, not to be a broken record, but um, it really depends on the risk assessment. I mean, that is, that's the 1st step that you want to take. So, I mean, how. Frequently is the operator does the operator have to interact with that machine? Do they need to be close or can they monitor it from afar or remotely? And is there a specific area of the machine that needs to be uh, protected or does the whole machine need to be protected? And then what Austin and Gerald said too, it's a, the risk assessment and the process is the biggest thing. And um, you know, with the hard guarding, um, that's great, but it might not be a great uh, solution for that particular machine. Same with perimeter access. Um, you might not have the, the floor space. Perimeter access um, has to deal with a safe, dis safe distance calculation that when that barrier breaks, uh, the machine will stop, maybe stop, or that specific um, application or task may be in a soft or a safe state. So, and that does take a larger footprint on the plant floor. Um, compared to a hard guard that you can put close to a machine. Um, keep in mind, though, too, a lot of that stuff needs to be, depending on the hazard, pitch point, uh, pinch points, um, you know, a hot surface, et cetera. All those need to be accounted for a safe distance calculation. And when you're mounting a light curtain or um, a hard guard or anything else, you you shouldn't be able to reach above, below, or around that uh, particular product. So there's a lot to go on in the fact I just can't take a phone call and a customer say, hey, I need to protect this. I mean, you, you really do need to get a risk assessment. And what Gerald just brought up too about getting people involved. Um, yeah, you need a lot of a lot of the plants that I go into, they have a safety team. I mean, they can actually do their own risk assessments with the proper training and the proper documentation. And you need maintenance. And the biggest thing is too, and not a lot of people realize is you need the cleaning crew. If you're working 24 seven, there's always a cleaning crew around. I mean, they're just, they're just uh, as liable or as anybody else to get hurt. So, I mean, you have to think of anyone that's gonna be around that machine from forklift to cleaning from maintenance to operator. So, um, but yeah, just not to sound like a uh, broken record, but uh, yeah, risk assessment is definitely the first step that you'd wanna take. Yeah, it really sounds like it all kind of comes back to that point, right? To kind of determine your, your plan forward. 
that risk assessment is so essential. Um, it's interesting also that, you know, some of these facilities have safety teams that we can collaborate with to move forward together on that and they perform their own risk assessments in some cases. Um, really interesting uh, to kind of dig into some of the maybe design aspects of this. We have a question for Chris. Um, and I'm actually going to take this slide down as well, just for this uh, question. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, so the question for Chris today would be, when is it best to use hardwired safety versus Ethernet? So, I mean, one of the major advantages to, to going with uh, Ethernet based safety is a reduction in wiring it, that drastically is simplified. Instead of hard wiring every device that has multiple conductors, you know, that you need to land, you're plugging in power and you're plugging in Ethernet and you're done, right? Then you're you're off and programming in the PLC at that point. Um, an example of this is with uh, the MAB, the multifunction access box from Rockwell. Um, they launched that product as a hardwired solution and and it used a, a 19 conductor cable. So that that takes a lot of time and effort to to make work properly. Um, the the second iteration of that product was a, a SIP safety product, and it literally went to a, a four pin DC micro and an M12 Ethernet connection. So so those types of things you know are immediate benefits. Um, another another thought on that is many customers often design their own gate boxes which requires design, testing, validation, you know, that takes a lot of time and effort to do as well. When you're buying a product, you don't have to go through all that because that's already been done. So those are a couple of things that come to mind. Uh, I mean, for me right away, um, the ethernet light curtain would be another example. Uh, you know, I can get things like beam intensity and do blanking in the PLC, um, you know, more tasks that can be simplified just by, by programming it as opposed to having to do dip switches and, and fiddle with wires. I don't know, what do you guys think? Do you have any other uh, any other instances or? I was very excited to see that the uh, laser scanner is now out on SIP safety ethernet and more and more products are obviously headed that way and with the built-in AOP and how easy it is to deploy. Absolutely, I, I th that's the future. Well, and I think from a, uh... From a maintenance perspective, um, typically when people are deploying these networks, uh, if, if you're doing it, we'll say the old school way, but just the hardwired way, like Chris was mentioning, okay, you have one one uh, piece of equipment, it's a gate switch that could potentially have up to 19 pins that not only do you have to, to wire those, so you physically have to go do the work, you have to make sure you're doing it correctly. And right, everybody, there's great electricians out there, right? I, so I'm not saying that they don't know how to do their job, but if you've ever wired anything, it's very easy to mix two wires up on accident and then you're sitting there troubleshooting. Uh, whereas, like he said, you can plug two, basically two cables in um, and you're up and running. So I think moving forward, the, the two big drivers I see from the actual physical deployment of the um, safety circuits or the safety networks is SIP safety or uh, a newer product that Rockwell has called GuardLink. And so GuardLink would be essentially more the, the hardwired version. But what we can do, we can actually build that out uh, to where you essentially have these taps that would go in line. Um, you'd, you'd build a trunk and then these taps allow you to branch off to your safety devices. And if we build that out correctly and kind of have a good idea of physical distance between uh, your safety products, essentially it boils down to M12 connections on everything other than the uh, the guard mat or the guard link safety relay that we have to wire. So I, I think going forward, getting diagnostics is extremely important, especially when it comes to safety. And so people who are daisy chaining their current circuits, if they're doing it hardwired, you're losing out on a lot of diagnostics or you're having to run extra cabling back. Um, these, both these options, SIP safety and guard link make that you get more information back and it's just, it's so much easier to deploy. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. I've got a, a really good example actually of a guard link installation that, that was uh, kind of saved the day. 
Um, we had a customer who, who kind of skipped, you know, I shouldn't say skipped, but missed something in the functional requirements. Um, they thought they could design to performance level D and the customer really wanted it to be performance level E. So they went out and had traditional, you know, MSR or GSR relays hardwired and were daisy chaining e-stops and gates. Well, as we all know here, right, that that's only going to get you to performance level D. The problem came in that uh, they didn't have any room left in their cabinet for anything. They couldn't go with a bigger PLC. They couldn't add IO. That you know, the initial thought was, all right, we'll get them a safety PLC and get IO and and do that. Um, but they they didn't have the space for it. So we were able to swap out, you know, with one guard link relay, you know, a couple of MSR relays, and give them the taps and and get them to that performance level E with with daisy chaining. So that was uh, an example where GuardLink really kind of came in and just uh, just saved their day for sure. <laughs> That's a perfect example right there of, of some of the flexibility and the benefits of GuardLink. Others would be uh, retrofit. Customers love the retrofit. For, I can, I, while the machine's running, I can run all of my M12 cables. I can land all of my taps. I can load my GuardLink relay into the cabinet. And it, at my leisure, I can start moving product into the guard link taps. So, yeah, another another opportunity there is in the retrofit with guard link. Yeah, I have a customer actually doing that right now. They're laying it all out in parallel. So then, when they need to switch over, I'm just basically uh, pop in the uh, the wires from the actual safety device to the guard link tap, and and we're pretty much just swapping over. And it's gone from. I won't say who the the competitor product is, but we've gone from maybe 15 safety relays to one guard link relay because we can bring in 64 devices on it. Whereas uh, if you're unfamiliar with uh, safety relays, typically we can only bring in, I mean, two channels is, is good. I mean, that's a lot. If we can bring in two devices. Um, so comparing two devices to 64, you know, it, that's a stark difference. And being able to use the Ethernet sidecar and fully display all the diagnostics on my HMI, it's a big yeah. deal. Yeah, and the analytics portion of that, you know, at a plant manager level, they might say, well, you know, guard door two on this machine has been open 65 times in one shift. What do we got going on there? You know, they can make OEE adjustments there to their process to get their numbers up. Yep, great point, Travis. That is a great point. Being able to realize just just by keeping track of the analytics of guard link, I can now see if I have somebody struggling in a cell with their job. Yeah. So retrofitting or moving to some of these solutions is off offering further insights in how the plant is running and kind of building on efficiency opportunities, it sounds like. Well, obsolescence and retrofitting, um, those are good opportunities to kind of do that life cycle iteration again and what we find is with with the new gsr relays and which GuardLink is one of um you the consolidation of part numbers is amazing i can build mm -hmm. out functionality that used to exist on 30 to 40 relays into less than five relays yep being able to use a solid state device and uh, something with dry contacts on one relay is a very, very big benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And from the examples that um, Austin and Gerald, you were giving earlier, it sounds like they're, the retrofitting process requires no downtime in a lot of instances. Is that usually the case? With guard link, that is true. Not true from so many other things, which is why it's so attractive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very. That, that's a, a great plus. And it sounds like that all again comes back to the first step of the safety life cycle, which is that risk assessment and kind of determining opportunities for those retrofitting um, upgrades. Uh, is there anything we want to talk about in terms of what Travis was just talking to us about with the analytics and some of the softwares that are out there that we mentioned earlier on? Um, is there anything we wanted to, to kind of touch on with that and benefits to um, moving to some of those? Or did we well, cover yeah. about all of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one one thing I can say about that is, you know, with a lot of the the things that we've talked about, there are face plates available from Rockwell. 
right? That make make these analytics and, and make this information very simple to implement into your HMIs. Wonderful. Well, yeah, we... I guess that's that's kind of the goal, right? Is if you have extra diagnostics, you want to be able to actually see them and not have to uh, not have to spend a bunch of time programming them in. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We have not received any live questions in our chat as of now. Um, if you guys have anything else to add, we can go ahead and do that now, or we can wrap this up for today. So anything else that you guys wanted to talk about re regarding the safety life cycle or any of the steps that we didn't cover? Can you put it back up? Sure thing. One second. Let me know if you can see it. There you go. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to quickly, you know, just stress that from an OEM perspective, machine builder perspective, they have a very good handle on this. But, you, you know, after install and validation, they they move on. It is now on the plant floor. And I, the biggest gap that I see in my area, and I can't speak to any other area, but in my area, the biggest gap that I see is in in five. And, and it's really about periodic testing and, and parts replacement. Because you got to remember, there's two things that I really worry about. It's not just safety, one, when I'm, when I'm testing, but I want uptime. I, I want to not have my safety system create downtime and headaches for operations. So I would like to, you know, maintain preventative maintenance uh, part replacements um, right there. And that's an engineer could readily put um, preventative maintenance periodicities together as a strategy based on the mean time to failure data for each of the products. So I just thought I'd point that out. Yeah, and another part to that, Gerald, a great point is, you know, product obsolescence, as you mentioned, right? Keeping track of that, you know, maybe you need to do an install based evaluation with us so that we can tell you what you have in your plant. Is it still a valid product? How much longer is it going to be a valid product? How many spares do you have? You know, those types of things uh, also can help with that maintain and improve process. Exactly. Opportunity for consolidation, storeroom savings right there. Yep, and if you do that IBE and uh, are interested in getting serious about safety and learning how to do risk assessments and things of that nature, um, a great course, at least for me, was uh, the TEV Ryland course. Uh, TEV is actually a, a European standard, um, but it's very comparable to a, a UL. Um, they'll actually teach you how to walk through uh, the uh, robotic standard risk assessment and um, how to identify risk and that's something you can get with your service local service specialist on and get you set up. Right. For class. I highly recommend the TUV class as well. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Great. I think everybody on the call has been through it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's great. That's a good takeaway. Awesome. Well, if that is all, we'll go ahead and wrap up today's session. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists who joined us here today. Um, you guys have just boundless knowledge on this topic. I know I've learned a lot today. Um, thank you to Joey for being our resource out in the comments section as well. And just a reminder that if you're watching this as a recording or if you have further questions for us in general, or if you want to know how to start the process of a risk assessment with your local McNaughton McKay branch, you can always reach out to us at the email address, which is down in our description below, macamaclive at mc-nc.com. Um, again, thank you to all of our panelists here today, Paul, Travis, Chris, Austin, Gerald. Thank you guys so much. Thank you also to our live audience here with us today. We hope this session was informative and engaging for you. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the McNaught McKay YouTube channel for more industry content like this. And we'll see you again live next month. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Rachel. You're in the Mac and Mac podcast. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.